Well, welcome back to the Uptime Wind Energy Podcast. We're here at American Clean Power 2023 in New Orleans, Louisiana, and we have a couple of special guests this week. Uh, but right now, we have uh, Greg Poulos from ArcVera, and Greg is the CEO and Principal Atmospheric Scientist with ArcVera, which is based in Colorado. Greg, welcome to the program. And the Thank we you. really wanted to have you on because we had Jessica on about a year ago mm -hmm. in San Antonio yep. at ACP in 2022. Uh, the data and the information and the analysis ArcVera does is outstanding. You stand apart from a lot of the other atmospheric companies because you're doing predictive uh, aerodynamic assessments of yeah. wind farms. And the, the one that was big last year was the bite. Uh, the New York bite mm -hmm. on the leases and what kind of power production you were going to see out of those uh, wind sites because the prediction was one thing from the operators potentially, I think the Ecuador's or Orsteds of the world. And what you were coming up with is like, well, maybe not as good as, as we have wanted it to be. Maybe a deeper dive here. Yeah, yeah. and mostly be due to wakes and interference and the way that the, the winds are pushing. So the, the uh, auction areas are not optimized for wind. Right. So you want to describe some of the process you, you have gone through and, and what information you found about the winds, so particularly in the bite area, what's new there? How, what, are, what are the winds really going to be in the bite when they all, all these wind turbines are installed out in, in the waters? Yeah. yeah, so the study we presented last year was more preliminary than what we're presenting this year, where we looked at the long-term effects on energy production right. from the three lease areas of key importance that were auctioned in that the last uh, Boehm auction, $4.2 billion was spent. Big money, yeah. yeah. You know, leasing those. <laughs> and yeah. so we wanted to look at uh, the potential lost revenue associated with the misorientation of, of those three lease areas. We call this the misorientation penalty. Um, right. yeah. So if they had instead oriented those lease areas north-south, they wouldn't interfere with each other as much. They pick southwest to northeast, uh, and the wind happens to blow from southwest to northeast. East, yeah. And so the southwestern most lease area wakes the next one, and those two together wake the third one, which is most heavily affected. And in this year's uh, version of, of taking that study further, we found that's between a half a billion and $2 billion of lost revenue, conservatively calculated, uh, for the the two that are in the northeasternmost, um, this is unexpected, but it comes from this new technique that we validated called wind farm parameterization modeling. Okay. It's an extension of what's called mesoscale modeling, which is a numerical weather prediction method that we have used for a decade. I've been doing since my degrees back in the 90s. Uh, so very familiar, old technology, well proven, but now validated for wind energy applications. And so we're just doing the tech transfer. Okay, oh, that makes a lot of sense. So the, so the people who bought or, or have the leasing rights to the southwest corner of the that bite auction, they're good. They're in good shape. <laughs> they're, in good, they're in better shape <laughs> yeah. than the rest I of I think that's in Venergy and EDF. Ah, yes. And then Kudos the next them. two to the northeast might be interested in these results because they probably ran a financial model that didn't right. include such severe effects. Right. And okay. th I, I saw a webinar that I think you were in a few months ago. Yep. Uh, where there are certain times of year based on the wind direction, specifically where the power production really drops. It, it, it has to do sort of the, with the seasonal aspect. Exactly. Uh, and, but it was dramatic. It wasn't like a percent or two. You want to talk to that? Sure. So uh, power prices and electricity demand peak in the summer when air conditioning's on and it's hazy, hot, and humid in 95 degrees. Right, right, right. especially on that east coast. Up on the east coast. And it turns out the wind is predominantly from the southwest along those three New York bite uh, uh, lease areas. So the, the effect is amplified for that reason, but it's also amplified for another more subtle reason that people aren't necessarily going to intuitively understand, and that is when warm air blows off the coast over the cooler waters of the Gulf Stream out there, that creates a stable atmospheric condition. That means hot over cold. Cold ocean, hot above, that's a stable condition. And what that means is it's those wakes are worse. So by arranging these three lease areas the way they did, they happen to pick 
an orientation that maximizes the negative effect during peak power prices and peak demand as well. So the majority of that lost half billion to up to $2 billion will come during the summer when they most need the power. So it sort of underserves New York ISO and the, yeah, you know, sure. the local utilities. And, it, it, and you know, there's some risk that the investors that paid all that money for those lease areas will suffer more than expected or didn't use this technique because we just brought it to market. Um, but we're just trying to warn people <laughs> yeah. so they're prepared. Yeah. So, so the opposite of that stable condition would be if there was a little bit more variability in the winds, if I'm, if I'm going to get that correct. That's right. Okay. Yeah, okay. so you can, the way wakes behind wind farms recovers by mixing strong wind right, above right, the wind right. farm down. If you right. can't access that because of the lack of turbulence which occurs when the atmosphere is stable, the wakes last a lot further downstream okay. and are worse for longer. And okay. that's what happens in the summer. Makes absolute sense. How far do these wakes extend? I think the number I heard last year was like 20, 30 kilometer kind of numbers, but I think your more recent analysis looking at this thermal layer extended them much further than that. That's right, yeah. We're seeing material impacts on energy production out to 100 plus kilometers. Wow. So over 60 miles. Wow. Whereas it's typically been thought that within five kilometers, we're fine. Yes, yeah, so that's yeah, the design so, standard so today. Yeah, do a hundred. Yeah, and and is that it, so? The atmospheric conditions that will be on, say, the east coast of the U.S. as the air comes off of a landmass onto the ocean body, is that how much different is that than, say, in the North Sea, where the most of the winds are coming directly across the water, hitting the wind farms on the water? Right. The effects are less in the North Sea for that very reason. They don't okay. have hot air blowing off the coast just because of the way the meteorology works. It's right. a, you know, every place is a little different. Yeah, absolutely. So then that has implications, that same sort of analysis has implications for like the Gulf region, where right. there's been a couple of auctions, sites located. Right. What are the initial impressions upon the Gulf lease areas? Right. Um, the reason we did the study was to hopefully affect the way Boeing chooses the lease areas to be more effective. Sure. And we have looked at the Carolinas case, we've looked at the Gulf, yeah. we've looked at California, and in each one, there's certainly ways to better orient the polygons that they're leasing offshore sure. so that they don't interact so much. Right. You, you can improve in pretty much every case, which implies that Boehm isn't uh, using this as a primary criteria for right. choosing those locations, which just reduces the amount of green energy that's going to be produced. Yeah. yeah, if you look at the geographic footprint of the lease areas that are already either leased, laid out, or planned for auctions, the majority of them you can look at and see where the ports are, and see that's where shipping traffic goes between them. So there's been, we were talking a little bit off air about why these lease areas were picked in, or, and designed and laid out in certain areas. And they seem to have not brought into considering the wind resource as much as impact on local economies, shipping, uh, maybe fishing rights and those kind of things. Yeah, marine fisheries, military, shipping were primary. And you can see read yeah, you the Boeing document yeah. and they describe it and they yeah. do not reference the wind studies that have been done at all. They just talk about the other criteria. Um, so it's unclear to what degree the wind and the direction the wind blows and these wakes were considered. Uh, so another question on the East Coast, uh, and maybe you guys have done some analysis on this as well. I know the initial um, New York bite auction was closer to shore. Yeah. And there's plans for some that are further offshore. Mm -hmm. do, do, are those ones further offshore because the land mass is to the west of them? Do they still have the same um, negative impacts with the wind, wind resource that further out, or is it less? Yeah, the, the, the prevailing wind direction remains from the southwest, yeah. uh, just further offshore. So if you were to do the same thing again and use southwest to northeast orientation, you'd be again causing the, the same issue over again. So okay. you're not escaping it. This state, The stable air idea that I mentioned earlier is yeah. still present out there, but not as severe because okay. you are further from the heat source, the land. Right. So. So what do we, what happens in these bite auction areas where the turbine locations are pretty much identified by some of the operators already? They have a, a general idea because they've done all the yep. surveys of the ocean bottom. Yep. They 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 know generically what this grid looks like. They're going to lay out. If I'm the farm behind the lead farm on the southwest side, 
Do I knock on their door and say, hey, guys, I need you to stagger your turbines a little bit differently? Is it, Or do we just go to court and sue one another forever? How does that play out? Because the, the company upstream is really going to be in a little bit of a hurt, yeah. right? Yeah, if, if, if there is legal action, I'm not sure what would happen. I don't think there's any rule requiring them to reimburse for yeah. wind that doesn't arrive. For wakes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, th th yeah. there isn't a wake penalty right now, weirdly enough, and I, and I know I'm really interested because I think this application that you're developing off the Atlantic coast and on this water also applies onshore too, right? We're, we're getting to a point in some of these wind farms where we're stacking wind farm on a wind farm on a wind farm. I don't know if we know a lot about the wakes in particular areas of the United States, and I, it seems like operators are looking around saying, hey, I'm losing like two and a half percent from what what my LIDAR data, what my wind data, what my MET data says, right. where is it? Is it from wakes? Yeah, there, there have been studies of that uh, by others, um, and it has shown that that gap, that's unexplained loss yeah. of energy, a large portion of it is actually explained by long-range wakes wow. that people have not thought were to be an issue because right. eh, five kilometers apart is fine enough. Let's not even pay attention to what's at 10 kilometers, 20 kilometers away. Right. When it turns up, when you add up all the different ways the wind blows and all the surrounding wind farms, the combined effect is rather material and it can amount to, I think the particular study I'm thinking of showed one to 5% yeah, wow. loss of energy, depending wow. on how close yeah. how many and whether the wind came from a certain direction or not. Right. Um, and we validated our modeling system, this same one that we used for the New York Fight Study, on shore and found it was much closer to reality than other commercially available pieces of software. Wow. Yeah, I think that's one of the, we've talked with Rosemary about that before, yes. say, that in the U.S., because so many wind farms are co-located in the same wind resource channels, basically, mm -hmm. they're getting hit by it, right? So when you're in Texas, the wind blows the same direction across <laughs> most of West Texas, yep. right? If you're in Tehachapi in California, that wind's coming through the valleys the same way all the time. Yep. Right? So, or if you're in Iowa, the wind comes the same way, and it doesn't affect one wind farm, that same wind resource is hitting dozens of wind farms. Yep. So uh, definitely, definitely some impact there. Yeah, we find the onshore range of interest is less than offshore where there's no topography yeah. and no yeah. uh, vegetation to churn up the air right create turbulence and mix out the air so uh, it's about 50 kilometers you want to be careful especially if it's a frequent wind direction right um so uh that's interesting you know one of the things that's happening now is the repower right so yep. i have a i have a neighbor farm and it's getting about 10 years old, and I know I'm losing a couple percentage points, but in this repower, they're gonna move where the turbines are. They may add turbines, they may take some turbines away. Mm -hmm. I'm and they'll have, be taller, probably. And they may yeah. be taller, exactly, <laughs> right. So what I assume now for a loss, a year from now, may not even be close. I may lose, I may lose a, a, another percent or two of power production because of where they've located the turbines in front of me. I think I sh should be able to address that somehow, at least provide them with data from our fair to say, guys, can you scoot that turbine over 100 yards because it would really help me. Right, the That's analogy would be uh, water rights. Yeah. Exactly, you can see it's it's exactly yep. like that, and, yeah. Yep. And there are a couple, of, uh, in California, you do have to reimburse somebody for energy loss uh, if you build upwind of somebody. There is a mechanism, we do those really? studies. Okay. Um, Brazil has, in their entire country's regulations, a uh, 20 rotor tip, 20 turbine tip heights, uh, you have to reimburse if you're closer than that. Now that's not 30 kilometers, but no, right. Uh, so it doesn't cover everything, but it is the beginnings of a water rights-like set of laws, which just don't exist in our country for the most part. It's and it's going to get worse and worse. The IRA, as great as it is, is going to cost three times as many wind farms yeah. to be installed in the right. central U.S., yeah. which means these interactions where each wind farm is cannibalizing each other's wind. When the wind blows from a certain direction, I get you. When the wind's from the other direction, you get me. Yeah. The combined effect of all of them together, if you think about it, could become quite substantial and cause a bit of a black eye in the industry as investor money is lost because of underproduction. Not because anybody's intentionally trying to hurt somebody else, right? But there's no way to reimburse for mm -hmm. all this activity. Uh, this gets very similar to what Windesco is doing for the swarm system, yeah. where it may be better to, you know, maybe point a turbine in the wrong direction a little bit. Oh yeah. Looking at these yeah. lo longer wakes, 
but it's really hard to model that. I think, yeah. as far as I can tell, you guys are it, Arcvera is it, in terms of really defining these long wake models and with the precision, it's remarkable the yeah. data that you produce, the images are shocking yeah, when right. you see it. Yeah. Yeah. They are, the, the visual impact is severe, yes. uh, for sure. And, and ultimately, you do have to look at the long-term effects, so the continuous long-term effects. Yes. Sometimes the visuals are even more shocking, you know. Uh, <laughs> yes. But when you look at the monetary effect, it's shocking that, as well. Yes, yeah. the scary part, right? And the investors who have a rate of return they want to make mm -hmm. should, you know, perk their ears up a little bit. <laughs> you know. I must say one of the coolest things on your website is the monthly report about the uh, amount of wind, the delta wind. It's up a little bit, it's down a little bit. It, have you seen this, Joel? It's a, it's a colorful map showing if the winds are up for the month of March versus what, last year, okay. the previous month. It gives you a sense of what's happening in the wind world. Mm -hmm. Why certain operators- Who had a tough month and exactly. who didn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And why, right? Yeah. That, that's yeah. great information. And I, I know I rely upon that because I want to look to see how the winds are moving. We're in, my company does lightning protection and in the direction of the winds is important to us because that's where the storms are coming from. So yeah. we need to know some of those things. It's a valuable resource. And I think Thank you. Arc Vera does a really good job of explaining the complex. The visuals are insightful immediately. Mm -hmm. And I, I think just the word needs to get out a little bit more, obviously, because you're doing such a great amount of work that, and I, I know you're here at this conference, I've seen Arc Vera all over the place, but it's fantastic, I think. And you just got to keep up the good work. So we really like having you on this program and we need to have you back. Uh, because I know there's more new work going on behind the scenes. Right. And there's there's constantly uh, more updates and science and research that's happening in the wind world about where the energy is going to come from. Yeah. So if if you're willing to, we'd love to have you back sometime. Yeah. That would be my pleasure. Thank you guys both. It's wonderful. <laughs>